Radiology of child abuse. You like that? You can take a little nap. Based on uh, data obtained from the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System and Child Protection Services, they had the Child Maltreatment Act of 2006. 905,000 children were victims of abuse or neglect. In 2001, there was 903,000. Children less than one have the highest rate of child abuse or neglect. 51% were girls, 48 boys, so it's basically the same. 48.8% were white, 22 African American, 18% Hispanic. All children, any race, any sex can get abused. 64% suffered neglect. Maybe they just didn't give them food, provide them food, clothing, uh, shoes when they maybe it's cold or blanket or place a safe place to sleep. Uh, left them uh, while they went to the casino, left them at home. 16% had physical abuse, 8.8% had sexual abuse, and 6.6% had emotional maltreatment. And they, you stupid little idiot, you're never going to amount to anything. Louis says, don't, that brings me back to my childhood. I'm joking. They love little, they love little Luis. Little Luis was a good little baby. It was a good little boy. Luis, they go, Luis is, is muy bien. Estimated 1,530 children died due to child abuse or neglect. In 2001, it was 1,300. Uh, 2.04 deaths per 100,000 children. 78% of those who died were less than four years. Uh, it makes sense because the little babies cry and they don't sometimes don't stop crying. And if you have anger issues, you could easily take it out on the little child or shake them to try to, because you're so mad, you're trying to get them to shut up and, and they don't. Other ones that are really abused are uh, ch uh, special needs children. They get abused a lot because they take so much time and so much care. Infant boys less than one year of age have the highest fat fatality rate with compared to boys of the same age. Infant girls at a rate of 14.7. 79% are perpetrators were the parents. 6% uh, were relatives. Uh, women were more often the perpetrators than men. That makes sense because there's a lot of uh, unmarried women that have children, so there's, there is no father figure. But then the boyfriends often will cause it. So you have to, if a child's being abused, you, you have to suspect it's somebody close by, usually a family member or somebody that comes over all the time or a, or a babysitter. But it could be, it could be somebody else. It could, who knows? That's what the Child uh, Protection Agency, they, they, the CPS people, they investigate all that stuff. 77.5% were younger than age 40 of the perpetrators. Well, that's the childbearing ages when you would have a young child. It's hard to, uh, it is not sexually abuse a teenage girl, or but it's hard to physically abuse a teenager because they'll fight back. But they definitely can be sexually abused, boys or girls. The history, Tardo, the French guy in the 1800s, observed subdural hematomas and abused children. Then John Caffey noted associations with, of long bone fractures and subdural hematomas that they didn't understand why they had the subdural hematomas, and he found these long bone fractures in 1946. And Kemp Silverman coined the term battered child syndrome describing metaphyseal fractures and periostitis. The metaphyseal corner fracture is the hallmark of child abuse. This was locations of fractures in 31 children who died of child abuse. Almost the major, a lot of them had, there were 84 rib fractures out of the 31 children. 15 knee fractures, 17 proximal tibia fractures. So when you get the metaphysical corner fractures, the most common places are your knees and your ankles. And that's usually their yanking and twisting of the, of the legs and feet. You can get metaphysical corner fractures of the proximal humeri, but often they're gonna have rib fractures. And so every chest x-ray you get, you need to really make sure that there's no healing rib fracture because sometimes the parents will abuse them and they feel bad. You know, they don't want to get caught, but they feel bad because they, they're scared they might have hurt the kid. So they'll come into the emergency room or the peds clinic and say, the kid has a cough. And so they'll get a chest x-ray and you'll see these fractures and then you have to worry about uh, child abuse. This is how they get the shaken baby syndrome. You can get subdural epidural hematomas. 
cerebral edema, you can get mass effect, uh, shift of mediastinum of, of, the, of the midline structures, they can get retinal hemorrhages from these shaken babies. Here is how you, when you're holding the babies and you're squeezing them, your index finger and these fingers cause these posterior rib fractures right here. And when you're squeezing in the AP direction, you'll get lateral rib fractures. Anterior rib fractures are not specific. Posterior rib fractures are very are suspicious, very suspicious. And this is how the knee, you, where, the, where the ligaments attach and the, and the joint capsules, you get these metaphyseal corner fractures. This is the site of immature bone, and so yanking and twisting causes the metaphyseal corner fractures. The common findings in child abuse are long bone fractures. Uh, the metaphyseal shaft, I mean the, the diaphyseal shaft can be fractured, and that's not specific, but if it's a two-month-old, it's really worrisome because how did a two-month-old break his femur? If it's a four-year-old and they were in a car accident or jumped out of a tree or playing football or soccer, they can get long bone fractures. But the metaphyseal corner fractures are still the hallmark. Posterior rib fractures are very suspicious, very suspicious. Scapular fractures take a direct blow to the scapula, so those are very suspicious. Spinous processes fractures. Think about your spinous processes. The way the posterior ribs go, the spinous processes have muscle on both sides of it, the paraspinal muscles. And if you touch someone's back, you're going to be touching the back of the ribs rather than the spinous processes. So those are very suspicious. Sternal fractures, that's suspicious. That takes a, like a direct blow. That's hard to break your sternum. Skull fractures, not specific at all. A good, loving mother or father could drop their baby. And if they drop their baby on a hard floor or a wooden floor, you can get a skull fracture. If the baby can move, they can roll off the couch. And if, they, if you have hard floors, they can have a skull fracture. Skull fractures are not, oh my God, you're, child, you're a child abuser. No, it's not. But you have to, it's all up to the pediatrician or the ER physician to put these in the, in the setting of what the parents say. And if the story is changing all the time, or I don't know what happened, he just woke up and this swelling here. And they go, oh no, when you say, yeah, baby has a skull fracture, they go, oh, yeah, he fell. The, you know, they start making stories up that that's really suspicious. This is a very good one here. Multiple fractures at different stages of healing. That tells you that there have been multiple episodes of trauma. If you have an acute one, a subacute one, an old one, there's been at least three episodes of trauma. They're, the lawyers defending the child abuser or the, not, the person that's being accused of child abusing are going to try to say it's rickets. And so they're going to, you, in your report, it'd be nice to say there are no, you know, mineralization is normal. There's no splaying or fraying of the metaphyses. And uh, the clinicians can get a vitamin D level and a calcium level, to, and that helps prove that it's not rickets. They'll also want to say that it's osteogenesis imperfecta. And so if you say the mineralization is normal, no wormy in bones, you know, that, that is helpful, especially to the, the what's her, Dr. Farrell? Yeah. Yeah, they're the uh, child abuse people here in Shreveport. But they will, when you go to court for this, which I've done it several times, tell them, one time I, did, I was in court for, I, did, I was at the courthouse for like two hours, and I told the, the lawyer to, uh, for the state, I said, I have the images right here. And the other lawyers for the parents said, you have images? And I said, yes, sir, of all the, of all the fractures, I'm going to show the judge. And then the, the, the lawyers kind of looked at each other and they said, come here to the other lawyer. And about 30 minutes later, he comes out and goes, it's over. Case is over. If you can bring the images, images are amazing. If you describe, say there's a posterior rib fracture that's healing, the, they don't see it. They're just hearing what you're saying. But if they can see it, if they can see it, that is even more for, to help the child out. And like I said, that one they admitted to whoever it was admitted to it. Because a lot of these are not going to go to jail. They will not go to jail. They're just going to lose parental rights. And a lot of times it's going to be the grandmother. Or if it was the dad that did it, the mother will have it, but the father won't. So they're not they're not going to go to court. If the baby died, they're going to they could be charged with murder. But if, if the baby's alive, they'll just lose their parental rights. So that's what they're going to try. The big ones are rickets and osteogenesis and perfecta that they're going to try to say the baby has. Subdural hematomas and cerebral edema, they can get that. And they usually will order a bone survey and a head CT. And so we're looking for anything. And then, of course, they're going to look at the retina for retinal hemorrhages. Visceral injuries. The most common cause of pancreatitis in a child is trauma. They, you, if you're suspecting, if they got bruising, 
uh, of the abdomen or there's or they have increased amylase or anything any abnormal liver functions they need a CT of their of their belly even though it's a kid ultrasound abdomen can easily miss a small little liver lap could easily miss a pancreatic injury especially if they're gassy uh, so CT even though it's radiation and things like this you're trying to save this kid's life for the future because if you say there's no abnormality in the pediatrician says okay there's no abuse Next time, the patient may not make it here alive. They may be dead next time. Common findings in child abuse. I told you the long bone shaft fractures are the most common type, but they're not specific, except if the baby's a month old or two months old. Uh, we had one that they said that the, they, the older son was playing with the kid and fell on his femur, and that's how he broke it. But then there was a metaphysical corner fracture of the humerus, which I'll show you. So the story is very important, and that's what the pediatricians no. If you suspect child abuse, when you see a radiograph, you have to document, you call them and tell them, and don't dictate, I suspect uh, child abuse, say I suspect non-accidental trauma. Non-accidental trauma means on purpose trauma. It's not an accident. It was on purpose. And I, at court, inadvertently one time said, this is consistent with child abuse, and the judge went, Dr. Gates, please don't use it. I said, this is consistent with non-accidental trauma, and he said, thank you. And so the lawyers, they're, they're going to act, they're, you're, if the, the mom and dad are there and the mom and dad and babysitter are there, there will be three lawyers, one for the mom, one for the dad, one for the babysitter, and they're going to ask you questions, and they're going to try to trick you up, because if you change your answer, now you're not dependable, you're not consistent. And they're going to ask you a question, and then they're going to ask you a different question, and then another question, and then they might go back to the first question and re, reward it a little bit, trying to hope to, to mess you up. And then, like one, the last one I was in, they go, so you're saying that they go. They, first of all, this is the craziest thing in the world. He goes, did you shoot these X-rays? Did you take these X-rays? I said, no, sir. The tech does. So you didn't even take these X-rays. Don't you think the person that takes them should be the one to read them? I said, sir. No one in the world, no technologist in the world takes the X-rays and then interprets it. The radiologist interprets it. But you weren't there. I said, no, I wasn't. So how do you know it's this kid? I said, sir, it's this, it's this child, and here's a follow-up of the same child. And they go, but it, so you don't even know what this kid looks like. I said, sir, I would, you could, he could come running in the room, slap me in the face. I wouldn't know who it was, but I know these x-rays. And so he was trying to say that I was, I shouldn't be the one root testifying since I don't even know who this kid is. And he goes, so you don't know who abuse, I said, I said, these findings are, these, some human being abused his child, physically abused his child and caused these fractures. There's no way that just happened. An animal didn't do it, a human being did it. He goes, but you don't know which human being did it. I said, no, sir, I don't. I have no idea which human being did it. But so they tried, and then the, the but the, the guy, the lawyer literally said, Judge, I ask that we uh, dismiss this case. And he goes, no. <laughs> you know, that was great. Overruled. <laughs> but the guy was really crazy. But they, they it's, just, it's kind of like when you used to take the oral boards, you get real nervous. It's nerve wracking being in front of a judge. And, uh, you you want to say to this and he goes he got, so i showed him the images and he goes are these exact images i said yes sir he goes so you're telling me if i held the child up these would be fitting exact i said no we mag them up some he said so that could cause disorder i said no sir it would not cause distortion this is just i make them bigger so you can see it easier he said so that's not this is not exactly how big this child is he goes judge we shouldn't we should dismiss this case and i said sir that doesn't make any sense this is what we always do but see what I'm saying? It just they trying to, they're trying to mess with you, and uh, like I said, there's no you're not there to say who did it. You're just there to say somebody did it, and that's the job of the the CPS, the Child Protection Services, to decide who did it, and the police officers. This is as as pathognomonic as you can get. It's not a hundred percent metaphysical corner fractures, but it's it is the most pathognomonic finding you can get. It's uh, for, uh, the corner fracture, the bucket handle fracture, those are metaphysical corner fractures. And I told you the knee and the ankle are the most common sites. It's the site of the most immature bone. So it's shearing forces perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. So they'll yank these kids and they'll squeeze, they'll just, just yank and twist the legs and that's what causes the ankle and the knee fractures. <coughs> this is a spiral fracture. Even my students said spiral fractures are, are child abuse, right? I said. In a little baby, yes, but in a toddler, no. In an in a older person, uh, a kid that's running around, 
this is why they call them toddler fractures because they're toddling around, they're running around, they're jumping and they're jumping off their playground equipment and twisting. And that's what a toddler's fracture is, is a spiral tibial shaft fracture. It's not a metaphyseal corner fracture, but it's a spiral tibial shaft fracture. So this, if this kid, which this kid is a toddler, this is not child abuse. 10 week old, femur is a tough bone to break. If you break a, a femur, there was some significant trauma. And this is a 10 week old, 10 week olds don't move. So there's no way that this patient could have fallen or rolled over because 10 weeks old don't roll over. So this took a direct blow to this femur or something bad happened and this is very suspicious for child abuse. And so they're gonna order the bone survey. And here, this is a different patient, has a mid femoral shaft fracture, a kind of an oblique fracture that displaced. And then when you come over here and you do the bone survey, he has a metaphyseal corner fracture here and one here. And so these are, this tells you that it's child abuse. You can go to court and say, this is, this is as pathognomonic to 100% of child abuse as you can get. There's no widening of the growth plate. There's no splaying and fraying for rickets. The bone mineralization is normal. Here is a healing metaphyseal corner fracture in a different patient. You gotta be careful because this smooth periostitis is normal in children 30 days to six months. In 30 days, not the first 30 days, but 30 days to six months, the long bones will have this smooth periostitis and it does not go from the, meta the proximal most metaphysis to the distal most metaphysis. It usually will go from the diametaphyseal region to the other diametaphyseal region. So it doesn't go all the way to the metaphysis. And you guys know that epiphyses have no periosteum. So you'll never see a periosteal reaction in the epiphyses. There is no periosteum. So this is physiologic. But this is a healing fracture, uh, metaphysic corner fracture. Mm -hmm. There's sclerosis. The other side looked stone cold normal. There's lucency here. This could have been a bucket handle type uh, fracture. Here is a different patient that shows you the bucket handle. What it does is it goes through the posterior metaphysis, goes right through the growth plate, and then goes through the anterior metaphysis. And that is a bucket handle metaphysic corner fracture, which is, if I just saw this one, i say that's child abuse. This patient had a metaphysic corner fracture of the proximal humerus. And the same patient had this uh, metaphysic corner fracture of the knee. Sometimes you can get a little bit of beaking, a little spurring, so you gotta be careful, because that's normal. But this is fuzzy and not distinct, so that was, that was a fracture. Rib fractures <clears throat> fract can be anywhere on the rib. Uh, a lot of times there's continuous because of the way that people squeeze and, 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 and try to shake the baby. But posterior rib fractures, that's the highest specificity of rib fractures for child abuse, the posterior rib fractures. They're gonna try to say, well, the baby stopped breathing and they did CPR on the baby. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you a later slide, they've done studies uh, and, and they cannot reproduce posterior compression forces on the posterior ribs from, child, from CPR. What about slamming? That, Either abuse or not abuse. Well, that would be abuse because you can't slap kids anymore. But that's it sh that, that should not cause a poster. If you just slap them, because it's. Like if they, they get abusive situations, you can also get poster from them hitting the kid in the back. Hitting in the back, but the majority of them are from the squeezing action. Anytime you hit with a big enough anything, you can break anything. Uh, chest compression, violent shaking, not CPR. It's seen in about up to 30% of physically abused children. Rib fractures are often present. When you do these bone surveys, you often see rib fractures. It's seen in 90% of physically abused children less than two years of age. So, because those are the ones you can actually put your hands around and shake, and they're the ones that are gonna be crying, and so that's, parents have that problems. You need to tell your parent, if you're a clinician, put them in the crib. They can't cry themselves to death, but you can sure hurt them if, if you're really stressed out and crying, if you've never had a kid, crying babies, oh my gosh, they, especially if you're tired, you're post-call and your kid is crying, you could, I, could, I could see how people that can't control themselves could hurt something. It's wrong, you have to learn to control yourself, but it, I mean, you just, you, it's tough. So this was that one baby that had the metaphysical corner fracture of the humerus. Here is a healing clavicular fracture, you don't, that's, the most commonly broken bone of the body is the clavicle. Second most commonly broken bone of the body is the other clavicle. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, clavicle <laughs> fractures are often from, tr from you like can, time I've heard that joke. but it's still <laughs> funny. It's still funny. <laughs> clavicle fractures at birth, if they have shoulder dystocia, 
they might break it by delivering it vaginally, or the, if it gets shoulder associated, the OBGYN might break it. Put his finger behind the clavicle and go anterior. You don't want to push it back into the lung, but anterior to break it. If they if fall, my son, that when he was little, someone grabbed his coat and just whipped him around. A bigger kid did, and he fell on his shoulder and broke his clavicle. Tony Romo broke his clavicle. You fall on his football. But here we have lateral rib fractures, and look at all this callus formation associated with these lateral rib fractures. And then look, do you see these acute rib fractures here? There are acute rib fractures too. So we have not only healing rib fractures, we, and then this, this is metaphysical quarter fracture, we have posterior acute rib fractures. So there's different times of uh, different air stage, different times of trauma. And they're always gonna try to say, well, this was probably birth trauma. And, and so you're gonna have to just know that you know, it depends on how old the kid is. And this was a little bit later. There's more callus, more mature callus formation present here. You can see these rib fractures really well. Rib fracture, I told you that it is rare in children undergoing CPR. It was not a feature of CPR, posterior compression. And they, the experiments failed to reproduce posterior rib fractures. The skeletal survey, what we do is we do, a, the, the clinicians here put scan, suspected child abuse and neglect. SCAN, they don't ever write child abuse, but they put suspected child abuse and neglect for the initials. It's an AP and lateral view of the skull, an AP and lateral view of the chest, a frontal view of the pelvis, and lateral views of the spine, and then frontal views of the upper and lower extremities to include the hands and feet. And we also do oblique views of the ribs. That's, and if you look into the ACR, that's what they say. You, you will get outside bone surveys coming in, and they did like a baby gram, and then a lateral view of the skull, and then uh, both arms on one image, one image that has, you know, half the image has this arm, half the image has this arm, and then the other, that's not appropriate. The ACE, it's 21 images. When we do it, it's, we do 21 images, and it, you, you do the humerus, you do the forearm, you do the hand, you do the femur, you do the leg, you do the feet, you do the pelvis, you do both oblique views of the ribs, and it's 21 images. And that's what the ACR recommends, and that's what they say you should do. But so many outside places do not do that. They do like a baby gram to include the, that's their chest x-ray and that's their pelvic x-ray. You know that this, the beam is being centered, if you do a baby gram, is right here, as opposed to in the chest and in the pelvis. And that, that could theoretically throw something off and you could miss something subtle. And the ribs, rib fractures, which we know they don't matter in, hum, in adults unless they're causing pneumothorax. That's what we worry about. But in child abuse, we need to see them, even though we know that you know, they're not gonna put it in a cast or anything, but we need to be able to identify uh, rib <coughs> fractures. They can do nuclear medicine scintigraphy, it, but the problem is a lot of these are metaphysic corner fractures. And what does the epiphysis look like on a bone, sir, a bone scan? It's hot, it's black, and a fracture is black. So you're gonna put a black metaphysic corner fracture right next to the black growth plate, you could easily miss it. So these are rarely done. Healing of fractures, you, this is, they're gonna, they're always, the clinician always wants to know about when it is. You cannot, for my pediatrician, you can't say it was done on Thursday. You, if you see periosteal reaction, it could be anywhere from four to 10 days. That means it, 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 if you see periosteal reaction, it's not gonna just have happened today. It did not happen the last three days, but a little baby, it could have happened in four days or it could have happened 10 days ago. So you can give that little range. And so, uh, the younger the child, the better the baby heals. And so you can start seeing it earlier. We don't, we don't start really healing with periosteal reaction until like 10 to 14 days. So we would want to wait for 10 to 14 days for us. Uh, but a little baby might have it at four days of old, at four days of age. And the peak is between two, uh, 10 and 14 days. Soft callus is visible as early as 10 to 14 days, peak between two and three weeks. The harder callus is between 14 and 21 days, and the peak is between uh, 21 days and 42 days. But if the, there's continually, if the, okay, remodeling is when, you know, remodeling is after you get your, your periosteal reaction, you get your callus formation, then you get mature callus formation, and then the body remodels the bone, and in about a year or two, you might never know the kid broke his bone. Kids are amazing how well they heal. Old, the older you get, you know, when you get old, you get, they revert to like a baby. We wet ourselves, we need help with stuff, but we heal horrible, babies heal beautifully. So that's the part that we, I wish we were like babies because babies heal great.
But if the kid is continually using it, or or because you know you, you start healing with parosteal action and then it breaks it, and you parosteal action it breaks it because you're continually moving it or continually getting trauma, these numbers are not going to be accurate. So you just got to realize that. And like I told you, the younger the patient, the faster the healing. <clears throat> Here's a skull fracture. We see a skull fracture. That's all you see. You can't say this is consistent with child abuse. As a radiologist, you can't say it. It might have. It might have fallen. He might have rolled over. The parent might have dropped the child. But here, you have to know your your coronal sutures, your lambdoid sutures. We do have your uh, that metopic suture right here. Uh, you can have squamosal sutures, but you've got to know that there's no suture going in this direction. That's a parietal skull fracture. And they usually will do a CT, and here's showing the sutures, and that's the skull fracture with the scalp hematoma. And in this case, you can see an epidural hematoma with a skull fracture, minimally displaced skull fracture with an epidural hematoma and cerebral edema. The ventricles were tiny, tiny, tiny. <clears throat> Here is chronic subdural hygromas, uh, subdural fluid collections, chronic. If you saw a hematocrit level, you saw white and then white here and black on top of it, that's old blood and new blood, so more repetitive uh, trauma. And for the abdomen, they can, they can fracture their liver, they can uh, fracture their pancreas, they can get a duodenal hematoma, they can get a renal injury, uh, they can do, they, they're usually very, especially babies, are very, very thin, so you can see how easy just, if you, get, sometimes they, they'll kick the kid in the abdomen or they'll punch the kid in the abdomen and it can cause all these problems. This was a pancreatic laceration. And this is what they're going to try to say is birth trauma. They're going to try to say that osteogenesis and birth defect in rickets. Uh, yeah, syphilis will cause periosteal reaction, metaphyseal fracture slash destruction. The hallmark of, syphil of congenital syphilis is Wimberger's sign, which is proximal medial tibial metaphyseal destruction. Uh, it looks like a shark took a bite out of it. But the earliest finding in congenital syphilis is a metaphyseal loosened band. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you look for a lucency in the metaphyses. They can get those little uh, periost uh, metaphyseal corner fractures from that destruction. They can get and whenever you have any in insult to the bone, you can get periosteal reaction. In scurvy, you can get pelkin spurs, which are metaphyseal fractures, but it's due to scurvy. They get big subperiosteal hematomas and periosteal reaction, but it's due to scurvy, which is rare. And so, you know, hopefully they would, we usually, congenital syphilis, they know that every mother gets tested for RPR. So these babies get, they're born and they say mother positive RPR and they'll do a bone infant survey and they're looking at the knees and the wrists for any signs of these. Leukemia can get fractures. So if they're leukemia, the only anterior wedge compression fracture that I've seen on a child that wasn't from trauma was a leukemic patient because they're on steroids and steroids cause osteoporosis and give you fractures. Trust me, I know, because of my wife. So here's osteogenesis imperfecta. This baby was zero days old. They're, they're little dwarfs because their, their limbs are small because of all these fractures that they've had. Look, both the radius and ulna here have been fractured. These have been fractured. The humerus has been fractured. There are all these healing rib fractures in a baby that was just born. This is a ribbon bone, a ribbon femur from multiple fractures. Uh, there's a fracture of the distal tibia here. Uh, there's bowing of the fibula. So this is a baby with osteogenesis imperfecta. And they're going to have, they can have blue sclera. They can have uh, wormy and bones. So that's why on the skull, the lot of you, the skull, look for wormy and bones, which are intrasutural ossicles. It could be normal up to six months of age. The differential is, uh, what was it, pork chops for wormy and bones. Pycnodysostosis, osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, rickets in the healing phase poor kinky hair syndrome, cleidocranial dysostosis, which is the hereditary. They, they have midline membranous bone malformations. They may not have their clavicles or their pubic, their pubic symphysis might be really widened. So any midline thing, cleidocranial dysostosis, and uh, then CHOPS, H is hypothyroid, a little cretin can have it, uh, can have poor, uh, warming bones. Otopalatodigital syndrome can have it, which those are all really rare. Uh, uh, Pachydermal periostitis and then syndrome of Downs. 
The most common is normal, up to six months of age, but osteogenesis perfecta is in there. I would say there's no warming bones. The bone mineralization is normal because osteogenesis imperfecta would have osteopenia. I know, but, but to start mentioning like OI in a, in a typical report, you know, I'm just curious, like, can you, like, know this is not it? This is, and it just kind of sticks your story? Yeah, if they, if they, the original report, I guess yeah, you can say I didn't mention it, but look, there's no warming bones. There's normal mineralization. The pediatrician, they're going to interview her, and she's going to say there's no blue slayer. There was no... Oh, that's good. Because if you get, if you get that, if you do that, it's a done deal. Even if they have absolutely no clinical features, just so that some jerk doesn't go free. Because that's good. That's excellent. I, I think it's an expensive test or not too expensive. It's pretty expensive, but it's, but worth, it's it. worth it. It's worth it. A child's <laughs> life is worth it. So here is rickets. You. you have the metaphysis. It's splayed. It's frayed. You see this cupping and this fraying. The bones are osteopenic. Uh, this is, and you know, when they heal, they'll get bowing of their bones. So, and you look for the rachetic rosary, the anterior part of the ribs will be really cut, really cut, and it'll look like a, a, like a rosary. So that's the kind of stuff that, that they are gonna try to get you to, that they're gonna try to trick you up and try to pass it off on that. But the clinicians will get a vitamin D level, they'll get a calcium level, and they'll say there's no laboratory findings consistent with it. And the, if, if she was Dr. Farrell, she's not in the room when I'm testifying, and I'm not in the room when she's testifying. So they, they but she will always, always come to me beforehand, and the attorneys representing the state always talk to us together, and we go over the images and all this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's important what you say. You'd like to document everything, and because they're gonna, they're gonna look at it, and you don't want to. You don't want to contra contradict a, any contradictions because then they're gonna. That's not what they try to do. That's what lawyers they get paid to mess you up, and then now your your testimony is unreliable because you said yes, and then the, now you answered it no. So that's all I have. Uh, you will see it. You will see it. I have a question. So let's say in a hypothetical situation, you were in court and uh, the lawyer. Wants to get wants to get you somewhere. Tries to mess up with you, sure. and and then um, they they want to know if you can prove that, just like you were saying, that the that the X-rays belong to this kid. So is there a way to prove it? If you well, the way I proved it is I how, showed. How can you prove that? Well, you got to say that the technologists. And they go, which technologist was it? I said, I don't know. They go, you don't even know which technologist. I said, it's one of our technologists. They followed the protocol. And they go, but see, I had the follow-up. And I said, look, this was from the bone survey. Here's that fracture. Here it is four weeks later. And you can see how it's healing. And it's almost completely healed. And this is the same name. How, what are the odds of we getting two different kids that have the exact same fracture that's healing four weeks later? Yeah, but can yeah, I can't. I cannot swear 100 percent that that's that. But they can repeat the if it matched what we got, and that's what we did. We had it on that one. But yeah, if you bring the images with you, I'm telling you, because that if you if that speaks a lot more, because uh, and it's usually almost always going to be just a judge. It's not going to be a, a jury. It's just a judge. And if the judge can see it, he can understand it a lot better. Do, you know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, that was But yeah, you bring the yeah. CD in, or, or you bring the images in, and that, like I said, that really that saved me from having to testify because the, the, apparently in the past nobody did that before, and I had it, and the the, the the woman's lawyer said, "You have the images?" I said, "Yes, sir. I'm going to show it to the judge because they're very impressive," and he kind of looked at the father's lawyer, and then he looked at the state. He goes, "Let's can we talk?" Two minutes later, he comes. The state's lawyer says, "We're done." They. They, the mom was abusive. I don't, I don't know. He didn't tell me, but one of them was. And uh, it's not. 
I don't know. It, it, uh, you would think that you would go to jail for that, but they don't. A lot of them don't. And a lot of times, the grandmother gets the baby, and so the kid still is being probably seen by the, the abuser. But hopefully, the the grandmother's taking care of the kid and it's not the letting them. Thing for us is half the time, like the abuser lives in the same house as the people that get an award of the child. They give them the kid, and so it's like, you know, what we went through all this. What was the point? It's frustrating, it, but yeah, you'll you'll have to go and uh, if you do peds enough, you'll be t you'll have to go to court, and uh, hopefully, you just got to do what's right for the baby. You're not you're not you're not saying you're not accusing any you're not accusing a certain human being. You're saying a human being did this, and what the guy, the idiot lawyer, was going, well, what if an animal did this? I said an animal could not have done this. An animal did not do a human. An animal human being did it. And he goes, so you you don't know that my client did it? I said, absolutely. I have no idea. I do not know your client did it. I do not know that. I do know a human did it, but I don't know which human did it. And he goes, but you couldn't even recognize the kid. I said, I recognize these images. I know these images, but I do not know what the child looks like. And I said, that doesn't matter. I said, I know these images. This is this child was abused.